I've worked on the disease to please a lot. And as you've heard me say, that in 1989, I had a really big breakthrough with that, reading Gary Zukov's book on intention. So I started literally living an intentional life where I don't make any decisions unless I think about what is my true, pure motivation for doing it. Because I do recognize the law of cause and effect that says the intention informs even the cause. So that before you have an action, there is a reason for you taking that action. And the reason for the action is what's going to actually show up in your life on the other end. That's what's going to come back to you, uh, that intention. So. That helped me a lot with the disease to please because I was always giving, 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 giving. And then I was always so thrown when people would come back and, and ask for more. And I couldn't understand why they were asking for more. But people ask for more because your reason for giving it is so that they think that you're nice. That's your real intention. Well, they do think you're nice. They do think you're nice and that is why they keep coming back. They come back because you're the nice one. You're going to say yes when even you mean no. So you're the person I'm going to call to go pick up my kids when I can't or don't want to because you're going to say yes even if you don't want to do it. So that's why people keep coming back when your intention is not really clear. So that took a lot of fear away from me. But at least for me, clarity of intention helped me live a more fearless life. You cannot live a brave life without disappointing some people. But those people who get disappointed, it's really okay. The people who really care for you, the people who are rooting for your rise, will not be disappointed. The only people who are disappointed are people who have their own agenda. And their agenda is not aligned with your agenda. And that's how I make myself brave. I say, well, the people who really care about you, who want you, who are rooting for your rise, those people who are rooting for your rise, they're going to be okay when you say no. I never read any comments that are coming from negative people. If I start to read something and shut it down, I will, I will, I will, not, take, I will not take that in. I have a kitchen cabinet, mm -hmm. and I've had a kitchen cabinet since the beginning of my career. Different people have been in that kitchen cabinet over the years, but there are a few people who are my resource who I know are going to tell me the truth. Your cabinet can go through all of those comments, you know, because feedback is great. You can get it immediate now. Your cabinet will go through and they can share with you the things, even that are negative, but that are not mean-spirited. Uh, I'd come off the glory and the victory of 25 years of the Oprah show and was trying to put together the pieces of building a network without the right pieces. I really was trusting other people's ideas about how to do it and it wasn't until I had the good sense to bring in my own team of people who I'd been working with, whom I'd been working with for you know the past decade, that things start to actually fall into place for me. And you know, one of the great, great, great things about, uh, for me, doing uh, interviews all these years on The Oprah Show and on OWN was that I got to learn from other people's mistakes. So I paid really close attention to the stories and I got to hear everything and everybody, all the theories and all the stories and all the layers and layers of dysfunction along with people's victories and their triumph. I took it in. I was a student of it. I wasn't just a talk show host. I was a student. I became a student of life, other people's lives, and how to live well by listening to those stories. So I paid, I paid real attention. And at a point in my life where I, where I can literally rejoice in the, the, the knowing space that I hold. There's a sense of confidence that can only come, I think, when you know and are assured that you are living life well and not from the point of view of having a lot of things um, but living life from the, from, from the, from the center space when, you, when you're living bravely when you're living bravely because you're living your truth it was during my show that I absolutely learned for sure for myself through other people's stories that there really isn't any such thing as failure and I could see the thread of courage that was required every time you fell down. I could also see, I could also see that failure was just there to inform you to move in a different direction.
It's just there to say, hey, not this way, over here, not over there, wrong place. And once I figured that out, it became easier to be brave. For me, education is about the most important thing because, ha because that, was my, that is what liberated me. Education is what liberated me. The ability to read saved my life. I would have been an entirely different person had I not been taught to read when I was at an early age. My entire life experience, my ability to believe in myself, and even in my darkest moments of sexual abuse and being physically abused and so forth, I knew there was another way. I knew there was a way out. I knew there was another kind of life because I'd read about it. I'd read about it. I knew there were other places and, and there was another way of being. And so it saved my life. So that's why I now focus my attention on trying to do the same thing for other people. Education. I don't think you ever stop giving. I really don't. I think it's an ongoing process. And it's not just about being able to write a check. It's being able to touch somebody's life in such a way that Mrs. Duncan touched mine. It's being able to make a child see the light in him or herself, making someone else see that for themselves. I know that if I didn't have the money, listening to somebody who had it, I'd probably not believe them. Because you can't believe it. Because if you don't have money and you're just trying to make ends meet, you think if you just could make ends meet, that would make everything all right for you. What I know is, is that if you do work that you love and work that fulfills you, the rest will come. And that I truly believe that the reason I've been able to be so financially successful is because my focus has never, ever for one minute been money. And the fact that the money has come has really surprised me. I've been just really surprised and delighted and very pl pleased and many times overwhelmed by it. But the money has never been the focus. The reason, you know, I think if you know, if you're on the road to success is if you would do your job and not be paid for it. And I would do this job and take on a second job to make ends meet if nobody paid me just for the opportunity to do it. That's how you know you're doing the right thing. One of the things that, if I may pat myself on the back for, is that I try to surround myself with people who are smarter than I am. I think that the ability to be as good as you can be comes from understanding who you are and what you can and cannot do. And what you can't do is far more important than what you can do, if what you can't do is going to keep you from flying as high as you can. Now, when I, my lawyer first came to me and said, you can own your own show, it literally took the ceiling off my brain because I had never even thought that high before. I never even thought that was possible. And everybody needs somebody in their life to say, yes, you can do it. I have a niece, pardon me, I have a niece who's um, 15 who several years ago, I said to her the same thing my father said to me. I said, you are too smart to get C's. I mean, I heard my father speaking. We were crossing the street one day, and she was talking about her grades. You're too, you're too smart to do that. You could, do, you could be an A student. And she said, do you really think I can? Oh, of course. So you're such a bright person. And she started getting A's and said to me a year later, nobody ever told me I could. And I, you know, I think one of the most important lessons to learn is that we are all responsible for our lives. But nobody gets through this life alone. Everybody needs somebody to show them a way out or way up. Everybody does. See, I feel best in, in surroundings where other people are smarter than I am because I feel like in, I can always learn something from them. One of the other big lessons I've learned, particularly in business, I think you have a responsibility to yourself to learn as much about your business as you can. And so I sign every check, although it is now tedious because the bills that come in from running, maintaining a studio, everything from Federal Express to Xerox to every tape that needs repaired and so forth, it gets to be a lot. I have stacks and piles of, of, of checks to do and I know that there are a lot of successful people who don't do that. I still have a tenement mentality. I've been very, very poor in my life. And so the idea of having uh, money and not being responsible and knowing how much money you have and keeping control of it is not something that I personally can accept. I know that there are other people who can, but it's, it's just, it is not a possibility for me. I need to know where it is. I mean, there are times I think I want to go to the bank and say, show it to me because, you know, just seeing it on a piece of paper, anybody can print out a piece of paper. So, um, yeah, I watch it very carefully and um, try to maintain responsibility for it. But my success in business has come, you know, when I first started being a, quote, businesswoman, I worried about how do you do this? And I realized that you do this the same way uh, as you do anything else. You be fair. You try to be honest with other people and you be fair. 
what I know for sure is if you focus on the substance, the success will come. And most importantly, let failure be your friend. There are going to be times, of course, where you're going to win a lot. A lot of things are going to go your way. And it's wonderful to bask in that adulation and to feel proud of your successes. But it's the times when things go wrong, when you fall or fail, that you're actually going to learn the most about yourself. You know, all those years on The Oprah Show, 25 years, we were the number one show for 25 years. And that's because I lived with the intention to serve the audience. When I was able to shift the paradigm to start to looking at, wow, what I have instead of what I don't have, what I have instead of what I thought I'd lost, I was able to begin to turn things around. But it's those moments of being of uncertainty. It's the moments where all of my mistakes show up on the evening news. I can tell if I've done something wrong. It's on the CNN crawl. I can read about it. But learning from the moments where things weren't going so great, being able to get still, to connect with that which I know is God, the force, the power greater than myself, and to come back and realize that in order to move forward, you move forward by taking the next right step. You don't have to know everything to do. You don't have to know all the steps to make. Just what is the next right move? And then there's this. I leave you with this. Nobody makes it alone. Nobody. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what their Insta posts say. Nobody makes it alone alone and so you will get nowhere without a spiritual practice you need a spiritual practice and by that I mean not necessarily religion for some people it is church for some people it is meditating for some people it's dancing for some people it's singing but you have got to find a way to nurture that which is the essence of you You've got to find a way to continually give back to yourself. I am committed to service. Service through my work, service through my life's purpose. And if you make a commitment, a conscious intention to be committed to the work that you do, to the relationships that you have, your life will unfold with such beauty and grace through that commitment. You know, every day for until the very final shows of the Oprah Winfrey show, I would have the producers come in and tell me ahead of time what their intention for every show was because I figured out around the second year of doing that show that it wasn't just about being on television and performing, that here was this opportunity, this offering I could give to people through the service of a television show to better see themselves through the stories that we're telling and through those stories help themselves to improve their lives. So I started using television as a tool of service. So as you're trying to figure out what do I do, how should I do it? First of all, I will say this, that when you don't know what to do, my girls have heard this over a hundred times, when you don't know what to do, you do nothing. You get still until you do know. Because when you have to ask everybody else, should I, should I, should I do this, should I, should I, and that's whether it's buying a pair of shoes or going with a guy, buying a house, taking a job, should I, should I, should I, should I. When you have to ask everybody else, it means you don't really know the answer fully yourself. So you get still, be still and know the answer will come. So many people are worried about building a brand. I hear kids on social media talking about their brand. And I used to really resent the word when people would say to me, oh, you have this brand, because I never, never even thought about a brand. I just thought about day in and day out, making the best right choice for me. But now I embrace it because I recognize people see me as a brand. But for me, it's not a business. It is a question of what do you stand for? And I will say this, you're nothing if you're not the truth. So I have made, I've made a living, I've made a life, made a fortune really, from being true to myself. And, and that's the, if I could leave you with any message today, that is it. Uh, the biggest reward 
is not financial benefits, though it's really good. You can get a lot of great shoes. Nothing wrong with great shoes. But those of you who have a lot of shoes know that having great shoes and a closet full of shoes or cars or houses or square footage doesn't fill up your life. It doesn't. But living a life of substance can. Substance through your service, your offering of your whole self. And the baseline for how do you live a life of substance is whatever is the truth for you. What do you stand for? So when I first started making money and it was, you know, my salary or my earnings were published all over the place. I mean, the first year I was like, really? Did I make that much money? Oh my God. Um, it was very difficult for me to figure out where my boundaries were because I'd grown up poor and didn't have anything. So it's easy when you don't have anything and people ask you for money. They say, I need 500. You say, I don't have it because I'm just trying to get my rent paid. It's harder when your multi-million dollar salary is now in the paper and you get a lot of friends and cousins you didn't have before. So how do you set boundaries for yourself? I was having trouble setting boundaries myself for myself for even strangers. People would just show up at my door in Chicago and say, oh, bro, I left my husband, please help me. And I would because she knows I have it. So what I learned was is that Oh, the reason why people keep showing up is because my intention is to make them think that I'm such a nice person that you can ask me for anything, you can get me to do anything, I'm going to say yes, I'm going to say yes. So when Stevie called me this time, I thought I'd try out my first no on Stevie. Let's start big. He wanted me to donate some money to a charity and I didn't want to donate to the charity because I have my own charities and I care about a lot of people, but the, the, the problem is when you, you have money, everybody thinks you just want to give to everything. So I said to Stevie, uh, I said to Stevie, no. And um, as a person who has that disease to please, I was waiting for him then to, to say, I will never speak to you again. I will never call you. I will never sing a song for you. And he didn't, he just said, okay. Okay? Okay, it's okay? He said, okay, check you later. What I learned from that is, many times you will have angst and worry about things. Put yourself in a state, like someone said this morning because their phone went off, they were mortified over a phone, I said, really? Um, you will put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So, learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me. What I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate. The captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. I've lived with who do you think you are my whole life? Not from myself as much as what was reflected to me. Because who do you think you are? You're, you're the color girl, come from Mississippi. Who do, who do you think you are? You're sitting up on national television. Who do you think you are that you can have? Who do you think you are that you can? So I used to fear hearing the term, who do you think you are? Or you must, think, you must be pretty full of yourself. Now I work at being full. I want to be so full, I am overflowing. So when you see me coming, it ought to make you proud. To borrow a line from Maya Angelou's Phenomenal Woman. When you see me coming, it ought to make you proud. And what you see is a woman so full, I'm overflowing with enough to share with everybody else. I'm going to own the fullness without ego, without arrogance, but with a, an amazing sense of gratitude that I've been born at a time where I am female on the planet and I have the great pleasure and freedom
to fill myself up. Knowing who you are. Knowing who you are. Being able to answer this question, who am I and what do I want? You know, many times when I go out of the country, I am baffled by that question to explain what is your occupation. I've, st I've stood there for 10 minutes. Well, am I a talk show host? Well, I'm more than a talk show host. Am I a businesswoman? I'm a businesswoman. I'm more than a businesswoman. Am I an entrepreneur? I'm more than an entrepreneur. So I just leave it blank or self-employed. So I'm not asking for the roles that you play as daughters. I'm not asking that question. What are the roles that you play as a daughter, as a friend, as a sister? You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to teach. You're going to be a pharmacist. I'm asking the bigger question of who am I? Who am I really? My answer is I am God's child. I am that which is born of all that is. I am, as Pierre de Chardin said, a spiritual being having a human experience. All that is possible is possible for me. That's who I am. And what do I want? I don't want to just be successful in the world. I don't want to just make a mark or have a legacy. You must have some kind of vision for your life. Even if you don't know the plan, you have to have a direction in which you choose to go. You want to be in the driver's seat of your own life because if you're not, life will drive you. Knowing who you really are in this space and time that we embody. What do you want? Who are you? Always do the right thing. Be excellent. People notice. Think of how you notice. You go to Taco Bell, somebody gives you an extra napkin and some sauce. You notice. You want to go back to that person. Because even at Taco Bell, excellence shows itself. And what I know is that when you are excellent, you become unforgettable. People remember you, you stand out. Regardless of what it is, you become an unforgettable woman. And that is what we all want. We want to be unforgettable and not forgettable. So doing the right thing, even when nobody knows you're doing the right thing, will always bring the right thing to you. I promise you that. I remember many times on my show, there are many shows y'all never saw. And the reason you didn't see them is because I got the last vote. And I remember 2010, my team, hardest working team in television, had done this interview with a woman who turns out she was a Sunday school teacher by day and a sex addict at night. And they were like, you won't believe it. We got her going out. We got her with the men. And we get to show her. And she was willing to show us everything. I sat down with a woman for an interview that was taped. And during the process of the interview, I said, why are you doing this? And she said, oh, I want to help people. I want to tell my story and I want to help people. I said, do you have children? She says, yes, I have a 10-year-old son. I knew right then this is never going to see the light of day. So we got off the air and I said to the lady, we are not going to air that show. And she said, why? My producer said, why? She knew she was being filmed. She knew what she was saying. She knows what you... I said, because her son will never get over it. Not worth the rating point to me to know that there's a 10-year-old boy who's destroyed because his mother went on the Oprah Winfrey show and told all her business. You do the right thing, even when other people think it may not be. And oftentimes, when you make a decision to do the right thing, immediately you're faced with doubt. Was that the right thing? Was that the right decision? I don't know, was that the right thing? You always know it's the right thing, when in the end, there is peace. You are rewarded by peace. The most important thing I have come to know in doing the right thing and making the right choices is understanding people don't always like you and they're not always happy for you. 
And if you surround yourself with people who are not accustomed to your success, they become fearful, they become scared because you are reflecting back something to them that they don't recognize. Now they're not gonna say, you know, I'm very fearful because you're reflecting back to me something I don't recognize. They're going to say, you know what they're gonna say? They're gonna say, who she thinks she is? Who she thinks she is? That only happens when you are around people who do not mean and want and aspire to the best for you. People who want the best for you want you to be your best. So my greatest advice to you is to surround yourself with people who are going to fill your cup until your cup runneth over. I did this at the end of my show. I did my favorite guest of all times. So that's hard to do out of literally th thousands and thousands. There's like 35,000 people I interviewed over the years. But there was one woman out of all the celebrities, out of all of the famous, non-famous, infamous people. One woman. Who was she? Her name is Terai Trent. Listen to this story. Tara Wright Trent, born and raised in a village in Zimbabwe. 11 years old, she's doing her brother's homework. She wants to go to school. Her father says, no, the boy has to go to school. You can't go to school. So she starts doing her brother's homework. She does his brother's homework. He goes to school. He gets all A's on his homework, yet he doesn't know the answer to the question. The teacher comes to the village to say, what is going on here? This boy doesn't know the answers, but his homework's perfect. She finds out that Tara his younger sister is doing his homework. She begs the father to let Tarai go to school. The father says, no, she can't go to school. Finally, he marries her off. She marries at 11 and a half years old. She gets married. She has three children by the time she's 18 years old. A woman comes to the village from an NGO, Heifer International, and asks, what are your dreams? This is gonna make me cry. Asks her, what are your dreams? This child has never thought about what her dreams were. She says, write down your dreams. She writes down her dreams on a piece of paper and she folds them in a tin can and she buries them under a rock. The first dream was to be able to go to the school and go to a school in the United States of America and get a college degree. She ends up through some miracle of the NGO going to the United States. She gets a four year degree in three years. She goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes her next goal on the piece of paper. She buries it under the rock. She writes, I want to get a master's degree. She goes back to the United States, she gets a master's degree. She goes back to the United States, she gets her master's degree. After the master's degree, she goes back to the rock in Zimbabwe. She writes down her final goal is to get a doctorate degree. And last year, she became Dr. Tarai Trent. I found her in the, in the Nicholas Kristof's book called Something the Sky, Underneath the Sky or the Sky. And I was reading the story I had Nicholas Kristof on the show. Nicholas Kristof, the famous New York Times writer. She wasn't there. She wasn't a part of the show. I'm reading the story. I can't believe this book, the story of this woman, as I'm reading the story. So when we go to do the show, the producers have Nicholas Kristof on. They bring on other guests, but this woman isn't there. I go, how, how could you not have her there? So we tape another show with Nicholas Kristof. We go back. I go, fine. We're going to find that woman, Tara Wright Trent. This time, by this time, she's living in the United States. We followed her back to Zimbabwe to the rock. We pulled the tin can from underneath the rock. And that is my favorite guest of all time. The reason why Tara Rai Trent is my favorite guest of all time is because she represents in that one story of the little girl in a village in Zimbabwe who had a dream, the heart, and depth and discipline to pursue it. She represents everything I tried to say in every show in 25 years. She literally, through her life story, sums up the message that I was trying to give to every single one of my viewers. You can, keep trying, don't give up. When I was about eight years old, I grew up in the church and I was going to one of those women's day you know how we we had we have church all day long the little girl that was supposed to be there to do a recitation uh, had gotten ill and so they said to my stepmother we need some a little girl can Oprah come back and do a recitation this afternoon my stepmother said yeah I'll have her back here this afternoon so this you know church ain't over to 1 30 so by four o'clock I had gone home and learned to recite 
Invictus by William Ernest Henley. It starts out, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. I was reciting it and doing the pit from pole to pole. I didn't know what I was saying. But at the end of the poem, there's the stanza that says, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now my little eight-year-old brain didn't really fully understand the power and depth of those words, but they sounded good enough for me to write them down and put them on my mirror. And those words, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, became a mantra for me. What it said is, I am responsible for the choices that I make in my life. I am responsible. Obviously, I grew up and was better able to articulate what those words really mean. And I discovered in physics class, the third law of motion. You remember what that is? And it's called Newton's law. And it says for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what does that mean? That means everything that you are putting out into the world, every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It means no matter what you do, the energy of what you do, what you say, and most important, the energy of who you are is going out into the world, into your relationships, and that energy is always coming back to you. You are responsible for the energy that you are pulling out into the world because that very energy, bam, is coming right back to you every single time, whether you believe it or not, because it is law. Everybody has a different talent. And the reason we're all so messed up is because you're looking at everybody else's yeah. talent yeah. and wishing you had some of their talent. All the energy that you spend thinking about, wishing about, being jealous of, envious of anybody else is energy that you're not only putting out that's going to come back to you negatively, but you're taking that away from you. All your energy should be forced on what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? How can I be used in service? Because Dr. King's message of not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And there is not a job in here that you can do that you don't switch the paradigm to service and not make that job more fulfilling. I don't care what the job is. If you say, I'm a singer, I'm a dancer, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a doctor, I'm a janitor, I'm a, I'm a clerk, I'm a... If you say, if I look at this from, how do I use this in service to something bigger than myself? It no longer becomes a job. It becomes an offering to the world. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end, as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first, first. And if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, but if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. My friend Eckhart Tolle, who's written this wonderful book called A New Earth, it's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this, he says, don't react against a bad situation, merge with that situation instead, and the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up, it means acting with responsibility. Okay, many of you know that, as President Hennessy said, I started this school in Africa, and I founded the school where I'm trying to give South African girls a shot at a future like yours. 
And I spent five years making sure that school would be as beautiful as the students. I wanted every girl to feel her worth reflected in her surroundings. So I checked every blueprint, I picked every pillow, I was looking at the grout in between the bricks, I knew every thread count of the sheets, I chose every girl from the villages, from nine provinces, and yet last fall I was faced with a crisis I'd never anticipated. I was told that one of the dorm matrons was suspected of sexual abuse. Well that was, as you can imagine, devastating news. First I cried, actually I sobbed for about a half an hour, and then I said, let's get to it. That's all you get, is a half an hour. You need to focus on the now, what you need to do now. So I contacted a child trauma specialist, I put together a team of investigators, I made sure the girls had counseling and support, and Gail and I got on a plane and flew to South Africa. And the whole time I kept asking that question, what is this here to teach me? And as difficult as that experience has been, I got a lot of lessons. I understand now the mistakes I made because I had been paying attention to all of the wrong things. I built that school from the outside in when what really mattered was the inside out. So it's a lesson that applies to all of our lives as a whole. What matters most is what's inside. What matters most is the sense of integrity, of quality, and beauty. I got that lesson. And what I know is, is that the girls came away with something too. They've emerged from this more resilient and knowing that their voices have power. Life has dreamed a dream for you. And your, your goal, your number one job is to figure out what that dream is. And align yourself with the dream because the dream cannot come to you unless you're willing to meet it energetically in the same place so if your energy is off which i say to my girls all the time they could teach this class right now on being in flow if you are not in flow with god's dream for you with life's dream for you if you are out of order if you are out of sync it cannot come to you it will not come because the whole purpose of your life is to line yourself up with the purpose and so if you are operating in fear if you are operating in uh, jealousy je jealousy will kill you when you are synced up with life life just gives to you it opens doors it creates experiences it allows you to meet people things show up you never thought were going to show up and you are doing what is the purpose of your soul being. I have paid attention to my life because I understand that my life, just like your life, is always speaking to you, where you are, in the language, with the people, with the circumstances and experiences that you can understand and interpret if you are willing to see that always life god is speaking to you now it took me a while to actually really get this and to understand it but once i did i started paying attention to everything letting go of energy that's clouding your vision and holding you back it's a life practice that i learned long ago that has freed me so many ways it's a fact that holding grudges against somebody who's done you wrong or replaying, revisiting hurtful situations in your head over and over only weighs you down and prevents you from being who you're meant to be right now because you're still energetically holding on to the past. The energy that you put into constantly rewinding to the resentment, why did they do that? Why did they say that to me? I didn't deserve to be treated that way. All of that only keeps you stuck. It will never change what happened you got to press stop and reject the urge to keep replaying so that you can then fast forward into the now for yourself. You know, a lot of people think that holding on to things that disempowered them is going to somehow magically turn it around. Mm -mm. As I said in my message a couple of weeks ago about forgiveness, you have to release the notion. Give up the hope that the past could have been any different. And you also must release the idea that people would do what you might do in any given instance. This is a big one. 
I had to learn and relearn before I actually got it. Expecting people to do what you would do in a situation only leads to your disappointment. Not theirs. They're going on with their life. So let people be who they are and either you accept it or you don't. Not doing that keeps you stuck in a circumstance that actually costs you time, costs you energy. And I can guarantee that oftentimes the person on the other side of the bitterness you're holding on to, they're not even thinking about you. In fact, they probably have just moved on. They certainly aren't obsessing the way you are. Think of it like letting go of any bad habit that just doesn't serve your well-being. Not an easy task. Taking the road to a more enlightened, healthy existence never is. So this is what I want to ask you to ask yourself. Why am I holding on to this? How is this serving me? And really think about the answer. Maybe it makes you feel validated. Maybe it makes you feel righteous. Or maybe taking on the pain is your way of recognizing the injustice so that even though it won't be made right, it can at least not be forgotten. Then I ask you, again, ask yourself, do you want to be right or do you want peace? Woo! This was huge for me. The unfortunate fact is that having both may not be possible. And also you may never get your moment of righteousness, so why wait for it? Choose peace. What I know for sure is that in this world, time is a moving on and it's our most valuable commodity. You can never get it back. So staying in that loop, playing it over and over in your head of hurt only amplifies your pain. Let it go. Exhale, make room in your heart for something that is uplifting. Surround yourself with people who want the best for you. You have the ability to shift the DNA of your spirit and control how you perceive life. So why not lighten your load and let it go?
What's up is down, what's left is right Chasing stars and holding you I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Keep the sky on your mind 